Thank you, um, and a good good afternoon, or good late afternoon. I'm, I know we're sitting here between you and the and the cocktail, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make it as um, as as attractive and, and as um, lively as as possible. So here we we really are going to converge the two streams of the data security stream and the payment stream, and we're going to bring here the best of both worlds together. Um, and if I j just, just recall one of the conversations I had, what was probably two years ago, with Charles Lee, so the CEO of, uh, of the Hong Kong Exchange. And uh, we were talking about, of course, we were trying to sell our stuff and saying, OK, well, you need to do something on, on the post trade. He said, yeah, I know that. We spent so much money over the years in improving our trading platforms that now my guys have convinced me that I need to do something for my, for my back end. And that's where the next gen conversation has, has started. And, and I'm sure these are the same type of, of, of discussion that have taken place in, in, in other exchanges in the world, in, in, in the ASX in, 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 in particular. And it's, and it's true, if you're looking at the trading platform, they've, they've, there's really a state of the art now. If you're looking at the computer power now, traders can actually trade at, at, at in a nanos, with a nanosecond latency, really opening a new world of, of opportunities there. And we've talked about technology today, and clearly when, when the blockchain on the DLT came, everybody thought, yeah, that's the end of the payments world. Everything is going to be revolutionized. And although we have seen some, some use case there, um, clearly it's really around streamlining and, and, uh, and, and, and addressing the complex processes where, where that, that technology has, has really a, a, a real a real potential. So it's not surprising that on the trade and the securities world that uh, we've seen more prominent, uh, to my point of view at least, uh, use, use case and, 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 and pilots and, and prototypes. And, but on, on, the, on the payment side, um, it, it, if, if you're looking at what GPI has brought, is really kind of, of, of an injection of rejuvenation into, into the old and sometimes, as people say, dusty uh, correspondent banking, banking world. Uh, if you're looking at the real time, I mean, all the user experience across the world have, have really been done through existing technology. I mean, if you're looking at all the new payments, the new payment system, all the new real time system across the world, it's all done with the, with the, old, with the old technology. And if you look at what NPP brings, brings basically that an innovative architecture on existing real and really bringing that experience to, to uh, that extra, the super experience to clients while, um, while, while um, uh, creating also the opportunity for additional uh, development in terms of, in terms of, 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 of innovation. So, so the, the interesting part is now is that if that create, if NPP is not only a P2P, as Adrian Lovney was mentioning earlier, is only a P2P just payment platform, but really enabler for any payment or any processes to be improved across the payment world. So of course the question that, that we can ask ourselves, I mean, what are the opportunities that the, the features of NPP could bring to um, to, to, to the securities, through the securities world, and that's what we're going to try to to discuss uh, to discuss today with with the panelists we, we have we have here. So um, I need to take my glasses here, not for their name, but for for their bio. I'm sorry for that. Ages. Um, so for my left is Jason. Jason Krebs is executive manager and for engagement for. NPPA and PBL is responsible for driving the NPP market engagement. In, in this position, Jason works with a financial institution and prospective, or prospective overlay services providers and other interested parties with a view of growing the platform. To his left, we have Robert Poulter, with general manager of asset servicing operation in NAB. Robert is also the chair of the Australian Funds SMPG. Uh, next to um, Robert, we have Cliff Richards, that has been already introduced earlier uh, in, in an earlier panel. So the general manager of equity post trade at ASX. And, and, and finally, Simon Wunder, 
who is a general manager, business development and strategy of managed funds outsourcing at linked services, where Simon, and Simon is responsible for setting the strategic direction of Link's managed fund outsourcing division and for growing its business. Before we enter into the, the, the core of, of the action and, and, and the discussion, we, we just want to, we wanted to make sure that to, to, to start with, I mean, everybody has uh, the, the, the same understanding of what, what NPP does. So we, of course, for the ones who were there this morning in, uh, for Adrian's presentation, it might be a little bit of repetition, but I've asked Jason to in five, six, whatever, uh, minutes, just to provide us with a, um, a, a brief uh, overview of what NPP does, what NPP provides. And what we're, going, what we're going to do afterwards is we look at all the various uh, uh, functionalities and attributes that NPP offers, that NPP has, and, and saying how does that bring value to the uh, to the securities world. Okay. Very good. Thank Is you. It? Thank you. Uh, I would like to just take a, a few minutes to summarise as best I can. Um, the, the new payments platform. So, you know, what is the new payments platform? Well, it's a, it's a real-time payments platform. You know, we're not the, the first region to, to have it, um, but there are some, some local differences. And one of the key ones is that in our instance, um, we, we have a, a concept of layered architecture. Now, I'm not going to provide a, a technical description, but just think there's, there's, there's two layers. There's a connectivity layer and a, and a product layer. And the connectivity layer is where all the banks uh, have, have gotten together, or you know, those, those banks on the NPP have gotten together um, to take care of the infrastructure side of things. And what that then does is kind of free up um, the, the, the rest of the market to, to build and innovate on a, on a product layer. Okay, you can have, effectively, you can have a, a, an entrant or an overlay service provider come in and build a product without having to establish connectivity with each individual bank in the country um, that the infrastructure part is, is taken care of. Uh, and that's a, that layered architecture is, is different to other markets uh, where core product is built into the centre, uh, effectively forcing every user to, to use that same product. In, in our concept, uh, we're really opening up the, the competitive space by allowing um, institutions to kind of pick and choose the, the overlays or the products and services that they might offer, offer their clients. Now, there's a long list of, of features. Uh, I, I won't go into all of those, but there's a couple I'd like to touch on because they're, they're relevant to, to, to today's discussion. Um, so 24-7 availability. Okay, it's a key feature of the platform. You know, what does that mean? Okay, it's, it's pretty obvious. It does what it says on the tin. You know, no downtime. But, but practically, this means no end of day cutoffs, means you know, weekends are a thing of the past with respect to, to payments, Christmas, et cetera. Right? So those kind of normal hang-ups, you know, you, you'd be able to make and receive your payment you know, in, in, in um, any time. Real-time payments. You know, how real-time is, is real-time? Well, you know, we're, we're talking, we are talking seconds. Um, you know, that's the, the, the full clearing and the settlement. It's not fudging it. It's not clearing and deferring settlement to later. You know, if it's a $3.50 coffee or a $350 million transaction, each one of those will be settled line by line with the Reserve Bank, you know, effectively making that you know, irrevocable, um, but also taking you know, that counterparty risk out of the market. We've got a concept or a feature called the addressing service. Um, the name of our addressing service is called PayID, and that is just a, a means of replacing having to quote a BSB and an account number to, to receive a payment. You can replace that with something that's a little bit more memorable. It could be your phone number, uh, mobile phone number, it could be an email address. And it's just a, it's just a proxy from you not having to, uh, to save you from having to give a, a BSB and an account number. But I do want to draw out, it doesn't mean that if you, you know, provide someone with your mobile number that a payment is going to your mobile. That's not the case. Or if you provide someone with your email address as your proxy, you know, it's not going to your email account. Okay? Just to kind of walk through that step, if, 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 um, if I was making a, a payment to Philippe and Philippe provided me his mobile number, when I go to make that transaction, I type in his mobile number, the system does a lookup finds his BSB and an account number, so I don't have to enter that, and that's what then fires off in the, in the message. So it's important that it's not 
um, the, the, conceptually it's not a, a payment to a, a mobile phone account, for example. Richer data. So the message standard that we've, um, that we've you know, built the platform on, it's been spoken about a lot today, ISO 20022, it, it contains obviously the payment information, but it can contain a whole lot of extra data. Now they, that, that data can be as in extra characters in the, in the message, it could be an attachment, or it could be a URL that could be linked to say an external document host to you know, go to a PDF or, or the like. Um, this is the real benefit we see of business. I, I think it's, it's kind of table stakes that, that payments you know, need to get faster to, to kind of keep up with, with modern times. But it's really the, the, the data element uh, and, the, and the process efficiency that process efficiency that can bring businesses that we see as a, as a really kind of you know, fertile ground. The next concept is, is overlays um, or overlay, uh, overlay services. So the message that's kind of native or the default message in the, uh, in the MPP, kind of, you know, it does what it does. It's a, it's a payment that goes from, from A to B. But if somebody comes along and says, well, I'd like to kind of take that building block and I'd like to add, to, add something to it. I'd like to um, have it settle faster, have it settle slower. I would like to include extra information uh, with it. I would like to change the routing of that message and put in some conditional workflow, a lot of kind of if-then statements. So by the, you know, the time it gets to me, there's all this kind of work that's, that's done to kind of validate that, that, that payment you know, before him. Where somebody wants to take that, that building block and add to it or enhance it or customise it, then we get taking going down this path of or this concept of overlay services, and that's where you can create your own product, um, and and yeah, really take what's there and and and, and customise it. Now, what's the kind of the MPP A's role in this? So it's I guess the, the new payments platform is is the platform, and and yeah, new payments platform Australia is the the operating team that, that kind of manage the, the the platform. You know, what's what's our role? Well, obviously, it's managing the the platform, but you know, what we're not about is building product, okay? What we are about is working with industries to understand, you know, what are the needs of the market and working with players in those industries to, to help, um, you know, shape product. You know, we, we, we won't, you know, for a moment um, yeah, kind of put ourselves out there as saying being experts in securities, but, you know, what we will do is work with actors in the securities market to help arrange all the building blocks to be able to build a, you know, a product that meets that industry's needs. Very good. I haven't counted, but I'm sure you were within this mix, the, the, so. the seven minutes. I'm, 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 I'm conscious I'm, we're in between drinks and a very yeah, first no, ab audience. Absolutely, you're doing <laughs> fantastically. Um, so so let, let's, take, let's take some of, some of the, these, these features uh, one by one. And maybe, Simon, let, let's start with, with real time and, and, and the real time clearing and settlement. So, uh, you, you, Simon, you, you operate on seven different segments. I mean, share registry, superannuation fund administration, and, and another one. So, do you, when it comes down to your client and how do you service something, do you see gaps between the, the way the payments are made today and what your clients uh, expect? And do you see value for having that real-time bit uh, included yeah. into your offering? Look, the answer is absolutely, Philippe. Um, we deal with a large number of retail clients, as you said, in superannuation, in equities, in uh, managed funds also. Um, and at the end of the day, our clients are interested in use of the monies that are being paid to them. So at the moment, if you take managed funds by way of example, a payment will come in. It might take three days for that payment to clear. So what we end up with is a situation where an investor has invested the money, but it may not be effective or they may not receive value for that for three days. So um, having real-time payments will certainly improve the process for both our clients and also for their investors. Um, it'll also neaten up our back office. So we have situations where, um, and, and I've seen this in, in prior positions as well, where we'll have some investors um, who pay real-time, some investors who pay through the um, ordinary ABA files, some who pay by chess. Uh, sorry, by check. So again, it will it'll help to streamline all the processes. Um, it, it'll also help on a, on an outgoing basis. So at the moment, when an investor wants money, 
um, we will pay them usually um, via overnight banking files, but there are some cases, so for example in uh, superannuation um, there might be a hardship case and in, in that case our client actually wants to pay the money quickly to their investor. We have the RTGS system open and available to us at the moment, but we're hoping that NPP again helps streamline everything, it'll be one single process and it'll just be easier for everybody. Robert, from, from your own point of view, I mean, as a custodian, of course, you are the, you are the core, as, as Alex mentioned earlier, I mean, the custodians are really at the core of the, of the, of the ecosystem. What is your, your take on that? Because, and, and where do you see, same question then um, asked Simon, the gaps between, from a custodian point of view, the gaps between the payments world as it works today and what NPP and, and, and real time could, could, could bring to your, to your business and to your clients? So it's actually nice to be called um, sort of at the heart of the epicentre rather than being the hurdle in the middle, sort of, you know, from being a custom, <laughs> custody well, point of view. Look, I think you know, MPP has got some really significant benefits as it comes out for retail investors. And, I mean, you know, for, for our world, for the custody world, we're not going to get the benefits for MPP initially when it first launches because we obviously we're doing a lot of bulk payments. So everything we do through the RTGS system, et cetera, is not going to flow through MPP initially. Uh, so we're looking forward to that changing. Um, I think the other big gap, as we see it from our customers' point of view, is the ability to actually re, uh, to utilise MPP to actually make foreign cash payments. So actually you're paying in US dollars immediately um, through the system rather than having to go through multiple banks and channels, et cetera, because uh, we do do a lot of payments overseas. And particularly when you start talking about when you get into the private equity investments um, and the need to have money there urgently, you know, the change in environment around regulatory, um, around derivative products, especially with the US dollar variation margins that have come out about the need to make same day payments immediately, so you've got that confirmation there. So we do see that as a, as a gap. Um, I think one of the other things that is probably a bit of a gap, and if I'm saying it from, not from a custody point of view, but from a communication point of view, you know, are we utilising MPP or the, the implementation of MPP enough to actually remove, as you know, Simon talked about, payments clearance about actually pushing this to, to get the retail investors onto, away from checks, you know, and not direct, direct credits, et cetera. I mean, checks are a thing of the past. Uh, we, should, we should be using this as a, as, a, as a stepping stone, if you like, to actually say, we want to move away from it um, and get rid of those checks. But you, you, it's, it's interesting because you, you, you were mentioning, of, of course, the, the, the margins, the margin calls on X. So, well, of course, I'm turning to you, Cliff, on, on, the, on, on the exchange. Where, where do you see, I suppose that for you, being able to have access to real-time money, or at least for your direct participants to be able to have access to real-time and being able to post real-time margins, is it, it's something that you certainly will be, will be able to look at? Uh, yes, and there's, a, there's an absolute spectrum of opportunity, um, and you can put a tick against everything. A lot of it will be, and I, I talked a bit uh, before about chess replacement and, and uh, digital, uh, um, sorry, DLT, I think a lot of it is supply versus demand. So we in the re-architecture uh, and the work we're doing around chess, we know that we want to be compatible with MPP. Um, we don't have digitised fiat in the system at the moment. Um, that's an area of interest. MPP carries central bank money, which is of great value. Um, but we're kind of led by our existing clients at the moment. And what I mean by that, they, they, we currently have about 130 um, connected parties to chess. Um, and for the needs right now, and if you snapshot right now, there's not necessarily a deficiency. Having said that, there's massive opportunity in everything from corporate actions uh, to where there might be demand for uh, shorter settlement times in securities processing. As you know, we have T plus two now. One of the things that almost comes synonymous when you talk about DLT and when you add the weight of NPP being a real-time payments platform is people, a lot of people assume that when you talk DLT, you're talking about line-by-line uh, -line settlement. So T zero or just T. Um, we've been, we're going through an extensive consultation process and we obviously talk to a lot of our clients who are global firms as well, there's not actually a massive appetite in certain parts of the industry for true T settlement. Um, there's massive benefit, uh, both balance sheet and operational benefit associated with uh, netting. So for example, an average day, today we probably did 1.1 million trades in the market. We'll have 25 to 30,000 settlement instructions going out. Um, so there's not, 
we need to be careful about assuming that there's, everyone wants to do everything line by line. Like, there are use cases where it makes perfect sense, but in securities processing right now, when we got responses from our consultation process, it was trimodal. We had a, a third of the market going, yes, let's move to, let's just get rid of all the risk, take the risk out of the system, pre-fund everything, bang it through. There's a third that are sitting back saying, uh, not sure, see how it goes. And there was a third saying, no, leave, the way it is is fine, which I don't necessarily agree with. But I, I just think we shouldn't assume that everyone wants to move to line by line real time settlement. So the MPP will, I, I think it'll, you know, it'll incrementally get more use over time as people get more comfortable with the risk profile of moving business that's currently got latency into a, into a, into a more real time world. Well, it, it certainly transformed the dynamic in terms of how the liquidity is required. Yes. In, in the process. Today, yes. the gap between the buys and the sells are usually financed, or pro the liquidity is provided by the custodians. While if you do a line by line, that, that's actually the. Yes, and the, one of the. The, the, the uh, trader itself, or the, 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 the direct participant itself, that will have to, to, to fund the gap between the buys and the sell. Yeah, and one part of our consultation paper was we put out there, look, we intend to, to ensure a smooth and orderly transition from current state to future state, we'd retain T plus two. And there's a whole bunch of very legitimate, valid reasons for doing that, not the least of which humans are involved. They need to sleep. And if you've got a fund manager on the U west coast of the US needing to respond to a corporate action, they can't if everything's happening like that. So there are reasons for latency being in the system, legitimate reasons. Um, when we went out in our initial, co initial consultation paper, we asked the question, would you like optional earlier intraday settlement? And again, we got a variety of responses, ranging from, yes, that sounds great, uh, retail investors. It'd be great if I could sell my BHP shares and go and draw out $1,000 from the ATM five minutes later. So NPP facilitates that, that reality. Um, but it, cre it, it throws up another whole, you can call them problems, but they're opportunities. So liquidity issues, you reduce the size of the liquidity uh, to be netted, so you're reducing an efficiency that exists there. Uh, what, what's the likelihood that intraday in a securities market you're going to find a perfect match uh, to meet you on the other side at that point in time? Uh, it's low, uh, but that's an opportunity. You've got, then you've got financiers that might come in and, and securities lenders that might come into that space as well. So the interesting thing about MPP is it just allows us to have this conversation because it takes that year, but there's no capability to do it 24 by 7 or real time. Um, so it's made a difficult project even harder by having this fantastic MPP in the equation. Mm -hmm. More choice. Yes. But before we move back to the 24 seven, on, for, for you, Robert, I mean, on, on that liquidity issue and, and the, the yep. reform, is it, is it something that would be critical for you in terms of? I think, that, I think MPP is actually going to really help us from a, from a credit perspective. I mean, from a custodial point of view, as we do sit in the middle uh, so we don't disadvantage our customers, we are making contractual payments on payday and we're making those payments before we actually physically see the money in our accounts. Uh, so we're carrying that risk, if you like, from a credit perspective that Simon and Link don't make the payment to our accounts as they're meant to for the, for the dividend that we're expecting. So actually having the ability to do almost, you know, sort of see the funds there on the pay date, uh, to do near real-time or real-time reconciliations is a, is a real benefit to the system. Um, it's really going to help us. And I think the other thing that's going to help as well is that uh, there are a number of, mar or a number of markets and products which we don't settle contractually within, within the custody world, uh, particularly around the, sort of the managed funds um, in the managed funds world and the unitised products. But to actually have that money coming in as well, because usually that funds are coming in, it could be five, six, seven days after payday. Uh, some, some of them actually still come in by cheque, but to get that real-time payment into the account, um, it's going to have a benefit to our customers as well. But talking about time to pay and the like, so we, one of the features as well is 24-7. Is and, and I remember we, in our conversation, that was really something for you, Simon, that, that was really so certainly relevant and, and uh, potentially useful. Yeah, absolutely, I think it would be. Um, you know, we've got several processes that can happen late in day after the banks have closed. So a, a good example might be on distribution um, payments. So um, particularly around year end or end of period, um, there'll be a, a process whereby you know, the custodians are calculating all of the distributions and there is a fund of fund structure. Okay? So there are various processes that are occurring quite quickly and what will happen is towards the back end of the day, there'll just be a backup of payments. So we may have multiple funds that are ready to pay at you know, seven o'clock at night 
but those payments won't actually be executed for a whole day because of the delays in the system mm -hmm. at the moment. So this just opens up the opportunity to push money out faster. Uh, would then would the, uh, the, 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 the back offices have the, the means also? Because I mean, yeah, you can do payments at any time. It just means we've got to be there 24 but, but, hours a day, don't Yeah, but, yeah. but you need to have the, at the end the back office who will be able to yeah. process that. So we have to be able to process it as well. But I mean, like Simon as well, we've also got the, the benefit of you know, utilising MPP because uh, we will get late instructions from customers to move funds. So being able to do it outside the window um, is going to be a benefit for us. But you're right, the, 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 it's, the, it's your downstream impacts of it's great for Simon to be able to push that, that information out at 7 o'clock at night, but I have to have people there to process it. Um, and until you get into sort of that whole technology around you know, robotics and artificial intelligence, et cetera, you know, that completes the chain, doesn't it? Then I don't need to have people there. I can use technology to, to process. And for you, Cliff, I mean, 24-7, uh, that could mean also longer training hours? Probably longer working hours too. <laughs> no, to your earlier questions about the amount of investments that have been made in the pre-trade space, we've had 15, 20 years of massive investments in pre-trade. Um, Best market routers, uh, HFT algorithms, crunching things down to nanoseconds, and basically 20 years of neglect to post trade and backs off yep. back office. We're now sexy, and throw in DLT, we're now really sexy. So, no one's laughing. <laughs> no, we are. Mate. It's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as we get the joke, Cliff, that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and, and the whole world is watching you. Eh? Yes, yes. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so. When we think about 24-hour uh, trading, it's really a, it's a demand side question. So there are markets that trade 24 hours a day. I think the bigger question is, is the Australian market going to stay open, the cash equities market going to stay open for 24 hours a day? Maybe, when the if, if and when the demand uh, uh, materialises. It's certainly not there now. We talk to our clients. No one's saying, you know, it should be a, tw well, sorry. There's not a weight of opinion saying you should be open for 24 hours. Um, I think what's likely to happen sooner than that is global connectivity. So connectivity between CSDs, uh, full dematerialisation of certain asset classes and fung fungibility or the ability to recognise a fungible-like uh, representation of securities globally, therefore giving a 24-hour cycle across markets, is probably more likely to Then you would have securities would be listed on mul multiple exchanges. Correct, yeah. So if I want to buy Apple, I'm not going through a number of intermediate trees, etc. I, I can own Apple. Actually, Apple is probably not a great example because in the US you don't actually own the stock if you're an investor. It's a piece of paper sitting in a vault of a subsidiary of the DTCC and <laughs> goes through a number of things. But perhaps Europe or Estonia, I could buy a share over there in Australia and know that I had legal title to that. And by virtue of there being a, a, a follow the sun approach, you might get a 24 hour market. Um, having said that, uh, MPP being 24-7, yes, it allows the payments with the rich message capability to go along with it. And I think that's uh, to Jason's comments on, on the overlay services, requests for pays, having that rich information. As a retail investor, it means when I get my BHP dividend and I see it in my NAB bank account, it's got BHP div today and a few numbers that mean nothing, but I can have the record, X, pay, whether it's part of a, a, you know, half of it's going DRP, half of it's going cash, it can be a rich message. And just that quality of data being uh, proliferated through the system enables all the other things that we've talked about, machine learning, AI, analytics, et cetera. That's the exciting part. One of the, just switching and moving to the, the another feature is which is richer data. Okay, one of the things that NPP provides is really through the ISO 2022, richer data. ASX so is also moving towards ISO 22. But uh, Robert, for, from your point of view, uh, do you, what are the benefits that you're seeing by being able to access or to be able to transmit richer data? data? Uh, look, I think Cliff's just hit it on the, on the nail on the head. It's about you know when we do get a payment and we've got the full details of what it exactly is, what it relates to, um, you know, the BHP dividend, you know, X date, payable date record date, et cetera. So we're actually able to match it up a lot easier. We're able, able to process it potentially, you know, around using uh, sort, of, you know, um, the sort of the straight through processing technology. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we've got to try and work out is how do we take that data and effectively get it out to our customers? Um, at the moment, you know, we, we have various methodologies of actually transmitting it, uh, but how can we similarly, how can we link in as a custodian without, without having a payment go through and actually get that information out to our customers in, in a faster manner, the big thing. 
For you, Simon, where, where do you see that the, the value in, through, in, in, your, in your world? This is what we're particularly excited about, actually, the richer data. Um, it, I think it opens up a lot of opportunities for us in communicating again, you know, with that retail investor base. So the, the, the outgoing data is probably pretty obvious. So, for example, when we send a, a dividend payment, we can potentially attach a, a dividend statement so that an investor will get that, I guess, the information along with the cash um, so that at any point in time they know exactly what's going on. Um, the, the, the incoming information is a particularly um, interesting one for me because it opens up a whole lot of opportunities in transaction processing, really. So corporate actions are a really good example of that. Uh, there might be a, a share rights issue. Okay, So potentially we could use the network to send a, a, an offer out to uh, an SRN um, or an IHIN and say to that person, look, there's an opportunity to purchase more shares. What would you like to do? Um, if we can use richer data to have them respond back to us and say, well, I'm interested in purchasing, purchasing another 10,000 shares, um, we can automate that whole process. At the moment, everything's just disconnected. And then at the end of that process, there's a payment from the investor or there's a, a request to pay from us and the, the investors will just simply click a button in their banking interface and the payment will be made uh, immediately. So really, that, that opens up a, a huge range of opportunity to... to I guess, um, automate a whole lot of processes that are unfortunately still manual in our world. It's, it, can I, it, and, and for you, of course, Cliff, I mean, uh, corporate action, we've talked about it. it yeah. It's really one of, okay, I guess, one of the use cases for you in terms of, in terms of uh, accessing to, uh, to NPP. Yeah, it, look, it, it's the low-hanging fruit, um, but that shouldn't be interpreted as it's easy because there's, there's decades of legacy of taking paper-based processes uh, and then 25, 30 years ago, share registries, exchanges, other providers, basically replicating paper-based processes in an electronic format. And now because of the size and scale of our markets, uh, we're balancing an act between going, let's throw all that away and redesign it the way we'd design it if we had this capability, this tech now. Uh, and the reality of knowing whatever we do, we've got to transition from current state to, to, to future state. Um, we see a huge opportunity uh, like Link in, in the corporate actions space, um, collapsing timeframes. One of the things, you know, our high level modelling when we were looking at everything that might happen uh, both with chest replacement and what it could deliver to the market in conjunction with things like uh, NPP. If you took uh, an average super fund, an accumulation phase of a 20 year old and modelled out them receiving dividends uh, seven or 14 or 20 days earlier, over 40 years, what would that do to investment returns? And the answer is good. So this is what's going to drive it. It's the reality of, of cost pressures and demand uh, for more, particularly from investors, which custodians face all the time. Uh, as part of the reason we, you know, we're looking at a suite of technologies and, and capabilities, we're, we're in a privileged position in the ASX. Uh, and parts of our business, the one I run, no one has a choice at the moment. You have to use my facilities. Now, the framework's changing so that it will support competition in that. But we, we recognise the fact that as a data repository um, and a centralised uh, provider of certain functions that we need to do those things to enable all, all the things we don't quite know how they're going to work out, robotics, uh, machine learning, uh, the analytics that comes off the back of that, delivering outcomes in a, in a faster, better way, is all conditional on, on better quality data. And part of the reason we looked to ISO, ISO 22 was pretty much a no-brainer. And when I was prior to the ASX, I was at NAB and we started talking about MPP, common uh, structures and data sets uh, across payments and securities, it was just a no-brainer to put them together. So that's the journey we're on. And, don't ask me the 10-year question as I was before. I don't know where it'll end up, but I think 15. it'll be a good place. <laughs> Ten thousand fifteen or <laughs> Jason, that, that must be music to your ears, right? I mean, hearing that NPP could actually be the Of channel. course, of course. Um, you know, I, I, I think the NPP brings with it a lot of opportunity and, and a lot of opportunity kind of in the short term, uh, but also, you know, real opportunity, not, not uh, you know, not vaporware opportunity. <laughs> Um, but also that capability will only build over time. 
Um, so I, I think that's 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 fantastic, and it's great to hear that you know there's there's different plays in the market, um, and there's some commonality around you know where there might be some um, uh, you know benefits, but actually you know for for the the different players in the mix, there's there's um, benefits, but there's al there's also challenges. Um, but you know at least now there's opportunity. It's, it's not necessarily going to be easy, but at least there's the, the opportunity. There's an, extra, there's an extra tool that can now be assessed uh, with which to, you know, people can make decisions on, on how to run their business, particularly the, yeah. the payments aspect. So it's, it's, it's super exciting. Two more of the, of the features, and then we're going to open the floor for, for question. The ad addressing services, I mean, Jason was referring to mobile number. Uh, and, and various ID, ID that can be used. Um, maybe Simon or, or Robert, I mean, probably more you, Simon, since you have uh, retail and individuals as your client. Do you see a value in that? I mean, wh where do you see the application in your, uh, in, in, in your world? Look, I agree with you. It's, a, it's really a, mostly it's a retail thing, right? It's what's going to attract people to the platform. I think it's the ability to, to sit there and pay my mate and pay his mobile phone number and, and know that the payment's actually going to get there. Um, so that's, that's really important. I think that it provides, obviously, a great user experience for people. So there's a step up there for us. Um, and it also provides, um, I think, the opportunity for positive feedback. So at the moment, I don't know what everyone else is, here is like, but when I type my bank account number and BSB into any sort of interface, I check it 14 times before I press go, right, because you're not quite sure whether you got it right. But your mobile phone number or email address is a, is a completely different thing. You use those all the time, unlike your banking details. And it also, the system will allow for positive feedback. So I use my mobile phone number as my pay ID and Bing, I send an SMS just confirming that that's the case and, and I can use a verification code as well and I can distribute that via email also. So I think it's a, it's a step up and, and really it's going to help to compete against these, these alternate new payment platforms that are out there, right? Facebook Pay or, or whatever it happens to be, WeChat. So really it's, it's moving the, the banking system into the 21st century. Yeah, indeed. But and interesting because when, when we had our, our call with uh, uh, I ask you the same question, uh, Robert, and then you're saying, well, in, in our world, it's, it, it's still the omnibus. I mean, yeah. so, but yeah. it, it might change the dynamic of the holding. So it, it's interesting, so I've, I've, since that conversation, I've reflected on it a lot. And yes, most custodians in Australia will operate under an omnibus uh, structure at the registries. Uh, so pushing that data out really isn't going to give any benefit because it's going to come to me and you know, jokingly said, you know, I don't want to get a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning because my number's on the omnibus account. Um, <laughs> But when I actually look at it a little bit deeper, I mean, over the years, um, you know, custodians, et cetera, have worked with registries to create sub-registers and to actually maintain sub-registers of beneficial owners. So, you know, because particularly events are at a beneficial owner level rather than at a, at a, at a legal level. There is an opportunity there potentially for registries to push information out to our customers. And when you get into the, the likes of the rapids and the jumbos and you've got a very quick turnaround, you know, there could be benefit there. It's just really a matter of whether our customers want to be getting information from multiple sources, because uh, most of them will see the custodian as the source of truth, um, and they, you know, that's why they appoint us uh, to get a consolidated view. So it's, um, yeah, it's an inter interesting conversation to have about whether or not it is possible. I think you know, it could be possible in the future. Yeah. I feel like wouldn't it be awesome if every retail investor's HIN could be mapped to their BSB and mm. bank account number? Yeah. You tell it once. Yes. Every corporate action has your hand on it, and it goes straight into your bank account. And wouldn't it be awesome for custodians if, in the replacement of chess, there was an account hierarchy that's set under a hin that they could optionally populate and put it's those same identifiers to? Yeah, absolutely. So they're the types yeah. of things we're shaking out through the consultation process. Yeah, it, it's really, to your point, it's, it's streamlining the process, but also improving the customer experience at the end of the day. Yep. Because absolutely. That's what Adrian was mentioning this morning around mm -hmm. that, filling the form once and having kind of the data that automatic filling, whatever your your proxy voting or, or, or whatever or your your real. Yeah, I think that's you just had, uh, that's one of the biggest applications probably is around your proxy voting and corporate governance because we all know that bro it's broken. It doesn't work properly. Um, but the ability to be able to send out an AGM proxy voting card to an investor, whether it's one of my customers mm -hmm. or just a retail customer, it is a real benefit. 
Again, uh, we, we go back to I think that all these new processes, new technologies, and, and new architecture, because sometimes it's, it's re-architecting. Yep. I don't know if it's really English, but anyway, re-architecting the uh, the existing world or the traditional world might sometimes give the the right the right answer to the uh, to the to the to, to the problems. Uh, now, I know that conscious of time, we only have probably four or five minutes. Um, one of the last feature, of course, is overlays. Um, Indeed, I mean, uh, to, to what Jason was mentioning is, is, is really where you want to bring that added value or that additional feature on top of the messaging that is part of, 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 the, of the, NPP, the NPP offering. I'm just throwing the, to any of you, is it, is it something that you, would, you, you see as, uh, that you would consider uh, as of today, as of today, but from what you know today, put it that way, even if it's something that might come in, uh, in two or three years' time, because I mean, the, the idea is that once it's live, that's where the value of the, the overlays will, will emerge with, with usage. Is it something that uh, you, 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 are, you, would, you would be considering? Maybe Cliff, you would start with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, two part answer. So, are we considering? Yes, we see so much potential in there. We know that we'll never be able to, as an organisation, um, uh, resource what it would take to to investigate all these areas. Uh, so the second part of the answer is we know, uh, like many organisations, we support Stone and Chalk and, and uh, very interested in the, the fintech and startup ecosystem. Uh, and Jason would know there's an awful lot of people looking at an awful lot of use cases in the overlay space. So there's that, there's that capability of where we are saying to, to startups and fintechs, hey, talk to us, bring us your ideas. Um, uh, and with this, to my comments about the better quality data being available, um, we think that's a space where we'll see, uh, you know, a rise of natural winners, um, and we can see opportunities of how we work with those firms. I've already reached out to one that pitched here earlier today. So, <laughs> so, so Simon. Yeah, look, I'd, we've talked about a couple of examples already, right, of where we might make use of overlay services. So the answer is, you know, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of challenges I see. You know, the, the first one is really the, the consumer interface, right? At the end of the day, if we're using an overlay to, to push data out and we're using simply a web service to attach information, that, that, that's quite an easy use case. If we've got um, an overlay, we've got a workflow like, for example, the uh, rights issue that I described beforehand. Um, we, we actually need someone to provide the consumer interface, the bank presumably, in, in order to enable that. Um, the, the, the other interesting question that you know, sort of I'd pose is to understand at the moment, all of these services are essentially predicated on there being a cash payment somewhere in the process. So the, the, the system requires or the rules require that there is cash involved at some stage, but there are various processes that we can think about that would benefit from mm. um, you know, perhaps from using the NPP where there's no cash involved and did, did you think, I think you talked about um, the annual reporting process or the voting process before Rob Wright. So there's not cash attached to that. Can we use NPP for that? And, and the reason I ask that question is that it would be nice to have some ubiquity in these services at the moment. It's quite disjointed. So for example, if you talk about an equity, some of the transactions are going through chess, some of the transactions are going directly to the register. Um, so we're using multiple systems and processes and those that go to the register could rely on electronic processes or good old paper at the end of the day. If we had a system that we could leverage to be able to automate all of those processes and provide a single interface to the investors, that, that's the dream right at the end of the day. Robert, of course, yeah. you, you're, I mean, your bank is a direct participant of the... Absolutely, yeah. So how does, do, do, you, do you see from, from, your, from the custody point of view additional feature that could be added? Oh, so look, from a custody point of view, from an overlay point of view, I think, yeah, and I think uh, David Braggart talked about one example of today around the managed funds applications and the process around that. Um, and yeah, I said David McAway was also linking into that with the, around the use of faxes. Um, you know, there's, there's still a large number within that particular um, investment strategy um, of faxes being used. I know you have Calistone and SwiftNet funds, et cetera, but there's still faxes there. So the ability to have an overlay service where an investor can actually, and then, then your money is linked to that as well, but the application form and the money being sent through would have significant benefits. Thank you all. I mean, are there any questions? We have probably can time for one or two questions from the audience. It's now or never.
they, I think they're thirsty. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Philip. <laughs> so, b before before you, before you leave, uh, I'll give you. Um, so, would like would like to thank you for 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 staying with us uh, today. Uh, clearly, the, the theme of the day was 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 innovation. And I hope that for the ones who've been on both payment and securities, I mean, you've seen that in the world that we're in, the, the integration of, of innovation is there. It creates huge opportunities. It creates challenges. But clearly, I believe that uh, we, we are there uh, to, to work together with you to, to, uh, to, to make sure that you, we can actually leverage on these opportunities and address these challenges. So I know it's late. I know we're all thirsty. Thank you very much. Drinks are served in the, on, on the other side. Thank you very much. Have a great one.